all transformation is story transformation. So if you want to change, you got to change the story you're living in and realize you have the freedom and the agency to change that story. You're not stuck in it forever. You have the right and you have the freedom and the power to define the story you want to live in. The goal of the Best You Podcast is to allow you to feel confident about what you need to do, why you need to do it, and how to do it in order to get closer and closer to your best you. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Nick Carrier's Best You Podcast. Today, I am super fired up to be with the one and only Ian Morgan Cron. Ian, I just want to start off by saying thanks so much for spending the time with me today. Man, I've been looking forward to it. Thanks. Yeah, awesome. Well, you know, we're probably four, maybe four miles apart, if that, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but still doing it via Zoom. But anyways, I appreciate you joining me today. And, you know, as we were talking beforehand, I know, and a lot of my listeners know the importance of self-awareness when it comes to getting closer to the best version of yourself. And that's what everybody here listening today wants to wants to do just every single day, get a little bit closer to the best version of yourself. And I know that you're going to be one of the top people I can talk to in, in order to how we can increase our self-awareness. And so we're going to be talking about the Enneagram today. For those of you guys who are unfamiliar with the Enneagram, it's a, essentially a personality test and there are nine types and Ian is a, a master of it. And he's essentially going to give you a quick overview of the nine different types real quick, and then we'll kind of go from there. So, Ian, I'll let you take the reins and give you an overview of the nine types. Sure. Well, um, let's just even back up a little higher, and I'll give you a 50,000-foot sort of uh, definition of what the Enneagram is or description of it. So, the Enneagram is a uh, an ancient personality typing system. It, it teaches that there are nine basic personality types in the world, one of which we gravitate toward and adopt in childhood as a way to feel safe, to protect ourselves, and to navigate the new world of relationships. One of the interesting things about the Enneagram as compared to, let's say, Myers-Briggs or DISC or Colby or Hogan, uh, all these other sort of um, personal assessments, you know, is uh, that it reveals the unconscious motivation that powerfully influences how each type acts, thinks, and feels, like, you know, predictably acts, thinks, and feels, habitually acts, thinks, and feels on a regular basis. So there are nine types, and I can do a quick run-through, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, tell you what the unconscious motivation is that really drives the behavior of each of those types, Mm. okay? All All right, right, let's jump in. So ones are called the improvers, These people are meticulous, uh, conscientious, dependable, responsible, detail-oriented people whose unconscious motivation is a need to perfect themselves, others, and the world. Okay? Twos are called the the helpers. They're warm, supportive, generous, self-sacrificing people who, and this is really simple, right? Their unconscious motivation is a need to be liked. It's just to be liked and appreciated. Now, all of us like to be liked and appreciated, but twos really want to be liked and appreciated, right? Um, the threes are called the performers. Sometimes they're called the achievers. And these people are goal crushers, accomplishment-minded, um, focused. Um, they are ambitious. Uh, they're people who have a need to succeed, to appear successful, and to avoid failure at all costs. Fours are called the individualists. They're kind of the unicorns of the Enneagram. We think there are more fours, I mean, fewer fours uh, in the general population than any other type. Um, Artistic, creative, sometimes temperamental, moody, self-absorbed at times, Um, incredibly imaginative, disproportionately represented in the creative arts. They uh, are people who believe that there is something essential missing in their core makeup. And as a result, they um, have a need to be special and unique as a way to compensate for what they believe is the missing piece, the unnameable missing piece in their their person. Six out of fives are called the investigators. Uh, Typically introverted, uh, very analytical, most analytical number on the Enneagram. Um, They are um, uh, people whose unconscious motivation is a need to conserve energy, 
uh, to uh, limit kind of relational time, right? Um, and to aggregate as much information and knowledge as they possibly can in order to fend off feelings of inadequacy and ineptitude. All right. Sixes are called the loyalists. We think there are more sixes than any other type in the world. Um, they are funny, earthy, practical, down to earth people. Um, loyal, obviously, given their name, amazing team players, uh, but their unconscious motivation is a need to feel safe, secure, certain, and supported in what feels to them uh, is a world that's chaotic and unpredictable. Okay. Sevens, the enthusiasts of the joy bombs of the Enneagram, funny, spontaneous, uh, adventurous, um, sort of gluttonous for new experiences. They're always, they're very future focused people and they see a future that's always filled with unlimited possibilities, right? They, they are optimistic to a flaw and their unconscious motivation is a need to avoid painful or distressing feelings or circumstances, right? Sevens aren't really sure that there'll be anyone there to support them should they fall into a, like a, a distressing emotional or personal state. Eights are called the challengers, blunt, domineering, commanding. Um, they are people who have a need to uh, mask tenderness and vulnerability, right? So these people are highly defended. Um, when they're not very healthy or self-aware, they can be um, aggressive, right? Um, they're those people who, when they walk into a room, you can feel it. They're just a larger than life presence, right? And, uh, so they like to assert strength and control over others in the environment in order to mask tenderness and weakness. Nines finally are called the peacemakers and, uh, easygoing, hakuna matata, go with the flow. You know, they're, they're just don't rock the boat people, um, and what they really want, what they are unconsciously motivated by is a need to maintain connection with others, to preserve a sense of inner peace and calm, and to avoid conflict at all costs. So that's the quick rundown. I could write a, I, I could write 100 pages on each of those types. So that's pretty damn fast. Yeah, I was going to say you could write a book and you'd maybe name it The Story of You. There you go. Um, that's right. That's yeah, right. So, so Ian has a new book called out, a uh, book coming out called The Story of You. And it's an awesome book. And, you know, a lot of you guys just listening to his descriptions, you probably heard yourself in one or maybe in, in, in multiple and some of the people that you know in some of those different types and you identify with maybe one of the types or, or some of the traits of some of the types and what his book, what your book does such a great job of is not saying that you're stuck in that particular story, which I love because honestly, to be completely honest with you, when I've heard people talk about the Enneagram in the past, I had a little bit of a negative view of it because I've heard people say, oh, I'm just this. So this is just how I am. And this is how I'm always oh. going to be. And I'm like, oh gosh, dang it. Like I hate when people pigeonhole themselves into this one number and so they can't change in any particular way. And that's almost the exact opposite of what your book is, is it's saying these are what these people's stories used to be. This is what they've done to overcome that. And this is kind of now who they are and how they leverage the pros of their type and how they essentially like work against the cons and almost like turn them into pros. And so your book does such a great job of giving examples of, of people and you people who will read the book will really identify with a lot of those char real characters in the book as well. But the kind of first thing I want to do to kind of step back is I was really intrigued when you first said about how these types are something that we adopt in childhood. So is it thought that it is adopted in childhood? Is it thought that we're born with it? And if it is adopted in childhood, at what point is it kind of like at four years old, that that's when the type is solidified or talk to me a little bit more about that. Sure. Well, you know, personality is probably the most hotly contested topic in modern psychology. Mm -hmm. Like the, you have so many different schools of thought about where does it come from? How does it develop? You know, it's just, you know, crazy. I remember my textbook in graduate school, I was doing a degree in counseling psychology. The, the book that we got on personality development was like, you know, that thick. It was like four inches thick, right? Because they had to go through all these different schools. To answer your question briefly, uh, is it nature or nurture? The answer is yes. I just don't know 
in what percentages, right? Is it, I, there's no question that uh, we are made up of, we have a temperament, a disposition. I had a kid that was born anxious. I have a kid that was born very, very calm. I had another kid that was born very optimistic and sunny. I mean, they just come out of the womb that way sometimes, mm -hmm. right? And it's pretty identifiable. On the other hand, personality is also shaped by environment, right? Not just genetics. It's shaped by culture. It's um, shaped by trauma, different experiences people have growing up. So, again, you know, I don't think anybody's ever going to know for sure about the mystery, the complexity of the human personality. All we can say, though, is that, and this is why I love the Enneagram, that we see types. We see types that have characteristic traits over and over and over again. And we see these nine types so often in the general population that we need to pay attention to them. And uh, so anyway, I'm not an Enneagram fundamentalist. I'm not one of these, there's only nine types. It's like, well, I don't know, but I do know that I see these nine types a lot. And so we should pay attention to them. Right. Right. Well, I kind of want to get it a little bit into your personal story with the Enneagram. So when was the first time that you took it? And when you took it for the first time, what was your biggest realization for it, uh, from it? Yeah. Well, I mean, I was in graduate school. And uh, again, this was when I was doing a master's in psychology. And I, I went on a retreat in the mountains of Colorado. And they had a library in this retreat center. And I just, you know, poked in, I saw this book. And I'm like, what the heck's the Enneagram? So I pulled it off the shelf and I start reading it. I'm like, wait a minute, where the heck did this come from? I've been studying psychology and personality for the last year. Like I'm up to my nose in it. And here is this incredibly accessible, uncannily accurate description of these nine types. And this would be insanely helpful in a counseling room, mm -hmm. right? It, yeah. Or in a corporate boardroom. I mean, it, this thing just has so many applications. So uh, I didn't actually take a test. My first thing was reading books about it. And then, um, which is an equally valid way to discover out, discover what your type is. <clears throat> and then I, uh, you no, know, for a while, I just didn't pay. I, I was so caught up in raising kids and getting degrees and doing different things. I didn't really dive very deeply into it. Took a couple of workshops, you know, whatever. Just, But I just never really did the deep dive until about 10 years ago. I had some time and uh, I had attended a workshop. I was like, you know what? This is, and, and not only that, but people were talking about it, you know, and I was like, hmm. And uh, so I did this very deep dive into it, really got to be a student of it. And then ended up riding the road back to you. Um, that book did astronomically better than I ever thought or imagined a book could possibly do coming out of my hands. And uh, which was really an indication that people are really, really curious about who they are, about who other people are, and how they can grow into the best version of themselves. Why did you, back in your college days and then 10 years ago, what about the Enneagram made you really feel like that was one of the best avenues or the best things to do to get closer to your truer self, as you like to say, or to get closer to the best version of yourself. Like there are a lot of different strategies that people use to, to help other people to kind of gain self-awareness. Why the Enneagram? Like, why do you feel like that was the thing that was your calling to work with? Yeah. Well, one of the things, I mean, I've worked with a lot of other typing systems, right? Or let's say self, self awareness or whatever you want to call them, assessment, whether it's Myers Briggs or it's Hogan or it's Colby or it's disc or it's strengths binder. I, mean, I can just strong Campbell. I can just go on and on and on. Right. And, um, but one of the things I loved about the Enneagram, well, two things really, one is, is that, um, it taught you that what's best about you is what's worst about you. And what's worst about you is what's best about you. Make sense. Like your blessing can become your blight and your blight can become your blessing. And just, you know, depends on the degree of self-awareness and the health you have. The other thing I loved about it is it took into account like those other typologies. Oftentimes you feel like you're just boxed, right? If the, the human personality is fluid and adaptive. So it's changing. It can be healthy. It can be unhealthy. It can be self-aware. You can lack self-awareness, right? And so you know, the thing I loved about it was is it, it, it took into account that the human personality is a dynamic, right? The other one last thing I'd say too is that one thing that I loved about it is it didn't just tell you what you do or like 
It tells you why you do it. And those other typologies don't do that. And that is so important, right? It's, it's, it's not a trait system where it's just saying, oh, okay, Nick, you do this, you do that in this situation, right? It's like, well, so what? I need to know why I do it. And that's, so for example, you think you're a three, right? Okay. So I could say, oh, okay, Nick, well, you're ambitious, you're goal-driven, you're accomplishment-focused, uh, you are probably a workaholic, you uh, are somebody that's, um, uh, things like metrics really matter, you are somebody that's, am I describing you pretty well? <laughs> yeah. Right? You're somebody who can walk into a room and read the room very, very quickly, and you can shape uh, or actually begin to... Um, change your self-presentation in order to win the admiration of the room, right? That's when you're not very self-aware. So um, the reason you do it is because, according to the Enneagram, is that you tend to believe that we live in a world that only values people for what they do and for what they accomplish rather than for who they are inside, right? And uh, that means because of that unconscious motivation, do you see how that would drive all the behaviors or traits I just described? Yep. So for you to grow, you have to begin to look at that unconscious motivation and begin to interrogate it. You need to start questioning it. Is it really true that the world only values people for what they do rather than for who they are inside? No, it's not true. Maybe in, in some instances, maybe, sure. But, but on the most part, or do you need to be successful before you can be loved? The answer is no. But the, the three tends to believe that those things are true. Now, when you begin to unwind those things, you, you will start to become the best expression of yourself automatically. Yeah, no, I love it. And I think that is, you know, it's, it was one of those things where reading my results is a little bit like, I'm like, I want to stop reading it sometimes mm -hmm. when, uh, when it reveals some of those things to you. But I think it really is important. And, you know, I was actually talking to my dad about my results and he was pointing some things out. And I was like, that was a little bit painful, but it's definitely some things that I'm going to think about when it comes to creating content on my social media and the different things that yeah. I, the different things that I do and the different ways that I interact. Okay. Yeah. So that's really healthy. Like that is developing self-awareness. Like threes typically struggle with uh, presenting an image of themselves on social media that's impressive, but not entirely true. Right, I saw that. They, right, and and so, yeah. I mean, the, I mean, look. I will just say this to you: if you're looking for flattery, don't screw around with the enneagram. Right. Yeah. But for me, that validates it, the truth of it. Right. If I, yeah, I can listen. I can take strengths finders all day long. Who doesn't want to take a test that all it does is tell you about your strengths? <laughs> but, but, and that's great. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying it's not the whole deal. Like for me to grow as a person, I also have to face some hard truths about myself. And the Enneagram is going to put those right in the right in front of you. Mm -hmm. And so when you do it land on your type, you're going to go, ow, oh, someone's reading my mail and parts of my mail that I don't really want anyone to read. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give you. I'm going to use me as a test subject a little bit further because that was actually, you know, when I said I was going to do some things a little bit different on social media, it's not necessarily that I feel like, and in, in what my dad pointed out, wasn't the fact that I was trying to put on an image that wasn't necessarily entirely true. It was that I was maybe sometimes using myself as the example that people should follow a little bit too often. We'll be like, I do this, so you should do it too, kind of a thing. And so if somebody does something like that, that says like, like I, I feel like I do that because I feel like it's working for me. And so I really want other people to do it. And so I just want to express that to them. So if, if that is in my head, my reasoning, what's a potential internal motivation behind why I am using myself as the example that other people should follow to maybe too often. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, again, the danger for a type like a three is that, for example, their communication style tends to be self-marketing. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to, as part of your own growth journey, begin to ask yourself, okay, when I put this post up, what is my motivation for doing this really? You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I have to do that with my type. You know what I mean? Other 
you know, in, in so many situations of life, I'm always sort of beginning to ask myself without being a navel gazer, without being self-absorbed, I am ask, I ask myself a lot, why am I doing this right now? Is it for the right reasons or the wrong reasons? Is this uh, a reflection of my true self? Or is it reflect, is it, am I trying to broadcast a self that actually isn't who I am, but I think will be loved more by others if I, you know, present myself this way? So, you know, this is so hard in the current environment for people like you and I in these jobs where so much is dependent on branding oneself. It's really dangerous. It's really, really dangerous. This whole idea that a person is a brand is really not always so great. Yeah, uh, I agree. I think I'm definitely going to make sure I analyze my internal thoughts behind why I make some of the posts that I make. But one of the things that actually kind of fascinated me when you were talking about type threes in regards to a lot of type threes think that they're only going to be successful because of what they do rather than who they are or be liked because of that particular reason or whatever it is that, uh, exactly that you said. Have you found that, you know, over the last, I guess, decade or so, you've been really full force on the, the Enneagram. Have you found that there's been any sort of shift in the frequency of types, like an increase of type threes over the last decade? I know you talked about how there was a couple that are the least common and the most common, but has there any been more frequency of certain types that you've seen shift over many of the last 10 years or so? You know, it's a, it's a great question. I think the what happens is, is that uh, certain factors come into play that bring certain that certain types tend to gravitate toward yeah. and become more visible. Doesn't mean that there's more of them. It will look like there's more of them. It's just no. Mm. So three sevens and eights tend to be the most assertive numbers on the Enneagram. Like when my like on my on my uh, podcast typology, right? We have publicists that approach us constantly, right? This person's just written a book. This person just started a nonprofit. This person just did this, right? And we want to get them on your show. They tend to all be three sevens and eights. Well, why? Well, threes are ambitious. They're goal-driven. They're accomplishment-centered, right? Sevens are great entrepreneurs. Eights are very, very bold and go get, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I, I would think, oh my gosh, the whole world is becoming a three, seven, and eight. No, it's just that given the media that we use, right? Certain types just tend to present themselves more. Other types are much more withdrawn. They're not as assertive, right? And so you might think, oh, there's fewer of those. No, no, there's the same amount, right? It's just that they're not appearing as much in the sort of settings in which we people just on social media and whatever, we just don't, these types tend to appear over and over again because they're kind of more of the go-getter type. Right. I think that was, I think it's well said. Let's talk about kind of a, a little bit personality more from a, if somebody has not taking the Enneagram or if they're intera interacting with somebody and they have no idea what their Enneagram type is. And, and maybe they do, or maybe they don't have an idea of what the nine types are. What can, what are the most important things when somebody is interacting with somebody else to like take note of or be aware of when trying to reply to other people or interact with people in the most intelligent manner based off of the other person's personality trait, right? Like, so if, I'm in talking with somebody who is also a three and they're ram rambling my ear off maybe about themselves and their accomplishments and the goals that they're going off of. And I'm sitting here also a three, like, I don't care about all your goals, whatever it was, whatever it is, like, what can I do to take note of like, okay, this is the way this person is. I need to respond in this intelligent way. We'll be back to the interview in just a second. But first, I wanted to share a quick testimonial from a past participant of the 10 week transformation program. I started running the 10WT in the beginning of 2020, and I've had over 150 people on counting go through it, and they've seen amazing results both inside and out. If you're inspired to join after listening to the testimonial, then go to nickcarrier.com to learn more. We'll get back to the episode in just a minute, but first, here's what they had to say. I'm Erin, I joined Nick's program because I wanted to get more fit, but just like kind of be more toned overall. So with Nick's help, he's really helped me figure out the best workouts that have reached, helped me reach my goals. And I've done three of these programs with him and every time I still see like more and more progress. So it's been really fun to just like over time, like see myself get more fit. Like he's literally given me abs, which is like my goal. 
Uh, my favorite thing about the program, I think, is the camaraderie with everyone. I've made some really great friends from it, and I'm actually shocked at how much I actually like waking up at 5 a.m. You should definitely join Nick's Hemic program. Well, you're, what you're describing really is one of the features of self-awareness, right? And um, I would argue, and this is actually from a study done at Cornell University, and I think it's really true. The key predictor of success in business, but I also think in life, and this is just research-based material, is self-awareness, period. I mean, it's trust me, it's not your competencies. It's your soft skills. It's your ability to relate to other people and to yourself in real time, right? So... You know, I think from my perspective, the really important thing, first step is self-knowledge. And that's what the Enneagram is great at. So you have to develop or I have to develop enough self-knowledge before we start trying to pick what somebody else is like, right? We need to know who we are, right? That's the first order of business. Then if you choose to use the Enneagram, you need to become a student of these eight other types, right? Not just your type. You need to know what other people are like. It's very difficult, especially if you're not a, a teacher or someone who's really mastered the Enneagram, to determine another person's type just based on their behavior. Okay, it's just not, it's not easy because um, the truth of the matter is we contain all nine types in ourselves. It's just that we're dominant in one. And so in the moment, what determines your type is the unconscious motivation. And I just went through all nine of them. And I can't see, people aren't made of glass, so I can't see the unconscious motivation in a given moment. Now, I've been teaching it long enough and studying it long enough that I'm probably better than the average bear in the moment, kind of going, hmm, I think this person's a, a three or a six or whatever. But I hold it very, I try to hold it with humility. That said, if I know the other person's type, um, I can um, be very, what I would call emotionally wise and strategic about how I interact with that person. What you just described earlier was a very unhealthy three, right? A three that has no, a, a, if a three was healthy and had self-awareness, they wouldn't be doing what you just described. They would have grown out of it, right? Um, I, you know, at that moment, I would probably say, like I would say to any number that wasn't very self-aware, if, was if I'm in a conversation with anyone who lacks self-awareness, I try to get out of it as pretty quick as I can. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like that person's on autopilot. I don't have much time for this. They're, you know, I'll come back with maybe in a couple of years and see how they're doing. But, or do you know what I'm saying? Or maybe a couple of weeks. But in this moment, this person's not operating in a healthy space. I'm just not going to spend a lot of time with it. On the other hand, you know, like um, I was with, well, let's say I'm with an Enneagram five, like they're the investigators. They're, emotionally typically detached introverted very private about their space their personal information i just know things about them that makes me that gives me a great advantage relationally that really helps me to communicate with them in the moment with as little friction or inefficiency as possible and i've seen that revolutionize companies i've seen it revolutionize marriages I can't tell you how many people have told me that the Enneagram saved their marriage. I mean, it just happens to me all the time at workshops, you know, or it saved my job or it helped me understand my child or it, you know, and I'm not saying that this thing is like some magic thing. It's not, you know, it's, it's a model. And by virtue of it, by its very nature, it's imprecise. But what it does give you is this amazing low resolution picture of the inner terrain of different kinds of people. And if you even get 10% more clarity about how other people operate in the world, people who are different than you, you have an incredible advantage on your hands, right? It's like 10% is a huge step forward in terms of understanding other people. So again, I, I'm, I may be prattling on here, but I, I think it's it's helpful to know all these things. Yeah, no, I love it. I, I think you just motivated me to study it further myself. And because I do think, like you said, so many of us have the importance of building relationships and the importance of life success and obviously career success is so much about relationships, which is so much about self-knowledge and, and kind of knowledge of how other people are as well. And so I'm definitely more motivated to go study yeah. these types as well. And, you know, the, actually the first time I heard you was on Donald Miller's podcast and he talked about examples of how he knows his Enneagram type, he knows his wife's Enneagram type. And 
how he acts differently because he knows his wife Enneagram type. So I, I do think it has so many great applications like that for sure. I was wondering, does, what was I going to? Oh, one of the things that you mentioned in your book to kind of overcome some of the maybe drawbacks or the cons of your Enneagram type, I believe it's called the, like your, the SOAR strategy. Is that right? S-O-A-R. Can you break down that a little bit for us? Yeah. So um, SOAR is an acronym, right? S-O-A-R. And I don't generally like platitudinal acronyms, except I've been in a 12-step recovery community for 30 years. And I've learned that an acronym every now and then can save your life, right? Uh, And can be pretty helpful. So with SOAR, the first is C, right? And what do I mean by that? C means you need to see and understand your particular personality and its story. You know what I mean? Like it has a story and you need to see it, understand it. Um, You need to become very familiar with your inner world. Enneagram helps, right? The next step is own. And that, that means you have to own, um, how your particular personality style and the story that you've been living in has really has really kind of hurt you and possibly other people, right? When you're on autopilot and just operating on the low side of your personality, you can bang guardrail to guardrail through people's lives pretty easily and, and you know, leave a little bit of wreckage in your wake. So really to ask yourself, what does it cost me to live inside the broken story of my personality, Right? Third step would be awaken. And awaken means, this has a lot to do with self-awareness. It's like, can you awaken to uh, the triggers and the circumstances or situations that tend to uh, make you fall back into the old story of your personality? You know what I mean? Like, Like, I can recognize in real time now when in my own personality type, I'm beginning to act and think and feel in ways that are self-defeating and self-sabotaging. And I I can pull myself back up. And I wasn't able to do that before I knew the Enneagram. It's like I was just operating like, you know, this is how it is. This is how I, and you know, you're just unaware. You're lacking conscious awareness. Let me put it this way. You're being mindless rather than mindful, Right. You're actually in reactivity versus receptivity. You want to be a person who responds to life, not reacts to life. And those are two very different ways of being in the world. Enneagram has taught me, okay, you know what? Right now I'm in reactivity and I want to respond to life. What do I do differently right now? So the last one is rewrite. And in this new book, The Story of You, I take a whole different approach to the Enneagram than I did in my previous book called The Road Back to You, right? In the the story of you, what I approach the subject this way, all of us live inside a narrative or a story that we adopt as little people to make sense of the world, right? We know this is true. All of us understand our lives through the lens of story. Uh, This is why we say things like, hey, tell me your story. Or we say, um, hey, someone will say to you, oh, man, I'm into a new chapter of life, you know, or, you know, turn the page. I mean, we just, it's just so obvious, right? All of us kind of see ourselves as living in a movie that's continually unfolding, (laughs) you know? Uh, We talk about the soundtrack to the movie of our lives, for crying out loud, right? So the problem is, is that those stories that we adopt as little people help us survive life in that season. But when we unconsciously bring them into adulthood, they start to wreak havoc on our lives. Does that make sense? Um, Carl Jung, the great psychiatrist, used to once said that what helps you survive the morning of life will kill you in the afternoon of life. So the problem is we, most of us are living in broken stories. The Enneagram reveals nine of them. <laughs> Right? right? Nine stories that we see repeatedly. And, it, and what we have to do is begin to see, own, awaken, and rewrite the broken stories of our lives. And that's what the story of you really is, is all about and why. And it's interesting that you know, the moment you talk to people about the story of their lives, it's amazing. Their eyes perk up, they lean in. And when you talk about broken stories, people go like this sometimes because they realize 
I mean, have you ever not thought to yourself, I'm like in a broken story. This story, I feel like I'm reading off a script. It's not mine. Mm-hmm. It's time to rewrite the story. I think all of us have to do that at some point in adulthood. Yeah. Is there anything in particular right now that you are working on trying to rewrite? Oh, yeah, because it's a constant, you know, as a writer, I can just tell you, even as you're working with your life, there's constant editing going on, right? Um, but, you know, I, when I was a younger man, and I mentioned earlier being in a 12-step program, that's for alcohol and drug addiction, right? And from years ago, I'm a four on the Enneagram. I'm an artist. I'm temperamental. I'm, I was moody. I was self-absorbed. I was melancholy. I sort of saw that I had this broken piece inside, and somehow or another, I had to be special and unique in order to try and compensate for that broken piece and to find belonging and wholeness in the world. That's a broken story, (laughs) right? That is not a great story. Now that story did help me understand uh, as a little kid, what I was experiencing growing up in a family where my father was an addict and an alcoholic, right? It helped me to kind of make sense of what was happening to me. And in that sense, I kind of owe it a debt of gratitude, even though it wasn't a great story. However, I dragged that story into adulthood and it led me into my own problem with addictions. It led me into my own problems with depression, it, a low self esteem, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I had to start rewriting that story. I didn't have the tools then, so it was slow going. I wish I'd had a copy of the story of you right? At that point in my life to go, oh, wait a minute, I can do this a lot quicker versus, you know, what it's going to take me right now. And so even today, you know, uh, sometimes I'll sort of lapse into this feeling like there's kind of something wrong with me. I'm different than everybody else. Everybody else seems to be more at ease in the world than I am, blah, blah, blah. And when I start to spot myself doing that, I can pull myself out of it now because I have that kind of self-awareness. And I have also begun to write, if I was going to name my old story, it would be Lost Boy. And I talk about my old story today. The title of my new story is Redeemed Man. And, And that is a whole different narrative to live in than the old one. And, um, there's a a wonderful, uh, psychologist at Northwestern. He, was a pioneer in this world called narrative therapy. And he says very simply this, all transformation is story transformation. So if you want to change, you got to change the story you're living in and realize you have the freedom and the agency to change that story. You're not stuck in it forever. You have the right and you have the freedom and the power to define the story you want to live in. Mm. I love that. I love that. I think that's the main message I want most people to get across today. You know, you said it earlier, what's I'm probably going to botch exactly how you said it, but what's best about you can be the worst thing about you. And what's the worst thing about you can be the best thing about you. I think that said it really well in the sense that maybe it's the worst thing about you now, but you can flip it, you can flip it on its head and and use it to your advantage. Are there any routines or habits that you have to like help increase your self-awareness or are there any things that you, like what are the things that you do on a regular basis that you feel like you're working on to better your self-awareness? Yeah. Well, um, I'll tell you what the big one is, and people hate to hear it. And it's the one that I teach all the time because it's absolutely necessary, which is I have a daily 20 to 30 minute mindfulness practice. So mindfulness meditation is a, tr- is a huge part of my life. And when I tell people that, they're like, oh, I've tried it for two minutes. I can't do it. I hate it. It's like, well, I mean, it's, that's why it's an exercise, right? <laughs> and that's why you practice at it. But the reason mindfulness is so important is because as a practice, it helps develop that part of your brain. By the way, this is just neuroscience that helps you to be able to step back and observe yourself without any judgment, without any, with a great deal of self-compassion and say, oh, look what I'm doing right now. I'm playing the old melancholy, I'm playing the old poor me game of the Enneagram four, here I go. And I'm able to step back. And the moment you can catch yourself in the act, the grip of the old story begins to dissolve. And you're like, oh, I caught myself. And you do it with a great deal of self-compassion and a great deal of kindness, right? And without, and being very kind of objective about it. It's like, oh, of course, that's what humans do. I just did it. 
And now I'm going to, you know, work on X. And it's amazing how that practice has has revolutionized my life. Yeah. I think like you said, it it allows you to take a step back and look at yourself from an external point of view. And I think that, I think that's that's crucial to increasing self-awareness because so many times we treat ourselves 10 times differently than we would maybe treat somebody that we cared for. So one of the things that I've heard before is treat yourself like somebody that you're worth caring for. Uh, and I mm-hmm. think that sometimes taking that external per- perspective can allow us to do that. Well, Ian, before I ask the last question, I just want to acknowledge you for erasing the old story that you erased back when you were uh, that lost boy and now a redeemed man. And, and I just think what you said today in regards to trying to encourage people that what their current story story is or what what their old story was doesn't have to be what their future story is. doesn't have to be what they live into down the road. They have the agency to change it and take ownership of it and, and make the adjustments that they need to make. And that's exactly what your book, The Story of You, allows them to do. So I just want to acknowledge you for putting that work out into the world to allow people to change the story of themselves. Thank you. It's been a been a remarkable adventure and i i as you can tell i could be pretty passionate about talking about it yeah, i love it i love it you got to be and then one of the things i actually saw on i think it might have been on your website like your mantra or something that really i think is an important perspective for people to take is and i'm going to botch it again but it's it's something to the effect of don't try to make some don't expect somebody to be something like just accept them for how they are because I think a lot of times we put expectations on other people and when they don't meet that expectation that we put upon themselves, then we're frustrated about it. And so I just, I just loved that. Yeah. Well, it's a, it is a universal truth, isn't it? We try to make people into something that will make our lives easier rather than accept them for who they are and accepting people for who they are is the greatest act of love. No doubt. No doubt. Well, I also want to make sure everybody goes and grabs uh, a copy of the story of you that's coming out here very soon. I know it's going to impact a lot of lives and ho- impact a lot of relationships and impact a lot of companies and, and work relationships as well. So make sure you guys go check that out. You can go to ianmorgancron.com to learn more about that and grab it on uh, Amazon and pre-order it there as well. And you can follow Ian on Instagram at ianmorgancron there. And you can follow his podcast, Typology Podcast on Instagram as well. Is there any other place that people can go learn more about you and, and seek out more information? Yeah, well, you know, the book that, if people really want to take a first dive into the Enneagram, they really should read my book, The Road Back to You, um, because it's sort of, the, it's a it's the only primer out there on the Enneagram, you know? So it's kind of an entertaining but informative read. You don't have to read a 500-page technical manual on the Enneagram, which lots of books are. This is a pretty reader-friendly way to dip your feet in the water and figure out your type. They can also take my test, the IEQ-9, yep. which is on my website. And um, and then finally, I would say The Story of You, this book about repairing, broke, rewriting broken stories. Dude, I couldn't be more excited about a book. I mean, I'm just so pumped for people to realize, oh, wait a minute, I'm not stuck here. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love it. That's awesome. Well, Ian, the last, last question is, I think that getting closer to the best version of yourself is both a constant journey and a unique journey. I don't, I don't think we're ever at that best version of ourself necessarily. And I think the way that I'm going to get closer to the best version of myself is going to be a little bit different than the way that you get closer to the best version of yourself. So for you personally, if, the, if there are three things that you can currently do or three things that you can currently work on to get closer to that best version of Ian that you could possibly be, then what are those three things that you could currently do or currently work on? Mm. I mean, what kinds of tools and practices am I using? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I've named, I named one, right? Which is my mindfulness practice. Yep. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's huge. Number two, I'm a big believer in read, read, read. Don't stop reading, you know, like, uh, and I've, I read a lot of spiritual literature from Buddhists to Christians to, you know what I mean? Like I'm always at 12 step stuff. I mean, I'm always scouring around trying to figure out, well, what's the meaning of this dang thing called life, you know, and immersing myself in that kind of thinking. And then I'd say the third thing is, is um, I really try to take care of myself physically. You know, there's no point in being on this journey uh, unless 
you know, if you're going to end it too soon. I mean, I, I just, I'm a big believer in eating well, exercising, um, making sure that my body keeps up with my spirit and my mind. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I don't know if I'd mentioned before, but I'm a fitness trainer. So that last part is, a. Uh, is uh, hits home obviously for me, but I'm a avid reader every single day as well. But those are three awesome things. And I, I hope a lot of people see that they should either continue to do or, or do more of and, and uh, implement that into their routine to help them get closer to the best version of themselves as well. But that's all we got today. And thought that was absolutely awesome. And I'm looking forward to everybody going to buy the story of you. Thanks so much. Thank you.